Okay, you can have a seat. Welcome to the warehouse. Um, we have been having all kinds of technical problems this morning. Um, so I had all these cool announcements we were going to scroll that uh, Pastor Andrea did and it crashed the computer. Thank you, Pastor Andrea. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Announcement-wise, most all of them are in your bulletin. Uh, I do want to remind you uh, about the strawberry sale uh, the UMW does every year. Um, you can sign up over here on the counter. They're $20 for a flat, which I have learned is a lot of strawberries. Um, but if you're going to do that, we need you to pay today. So uh, sign up and pay today. Uh, after this uh, service this morning, we're having a Bible school planning meeting. Where, Miss Brenda? In the church library. In the church library. Uh, no commitment. No commitment. <laughs> but we do have volunteer sign-up sheets. Well, you just took away what I was going to say. But <laughs> you don't have to necessarily volunteer today. If you want to come, listen to what we're doing this year, what the theme are, think about it, uh, or we can certainly sign you up while you're there. Uh, next week, um, during the Sunday school hour, we're having a church cleanup, and what we're basically asking is, we've got a lot of Sunday school rooms that have kind of been neglected, for lack of a better word. Stuff tends to get piled in there, so we're going to use that time to uh, clean those things up. So, um, we're not going to do the video because I'm scared of what it's going to do to the computer today. So, um, during the next song, we're going to take up the offering, and then uh, we'll have a message for you.
say but um, you know when you look at that on the front of the bulletin it says you know Rick Waters worship leader but I mean I'm like the least important person up there if you see I mean I, I could really do months worth of services and never sing anything and we'd be great so I'm glad we're not one of those um, churches that you know puts the same person up on stage if you just hear every song uh, no offense to any of those people, but I think we're very, very lucky. Uh, really consistently since we've been doing this service, we've got great Daddy, singers. So, I mean, if you notice, I didn't sing anything. I'm just up there. Um, second thing, uh, if you look in the bulletin today, uh, the title of the sermon is Family Feud. I don't even like Family Feud. That's not the title of the sermon. Um, Peter, just to give you an update, um, had to take his wife to Atlanta uh, unexpectedly. Um, I did talk to him yesterday. Uh, she is improving, and is supposed to, they, uh, unless something changes, they're coming home today. So that's good news. Um, even though uh, in the world today, you know, they uh, decapitate you and then send you home the next day at the hospital. So, but um, it is good that that uh, she is uh, coming home today. I think. So I'm going to share a little bit with you today. Um, Ernest Hemingway uh, wrote a book or a short story that I read in college. I have a minor in English, and I took some classes where like the whole class was one author, which is great unless you don't like the author. Then it's a really long, long semester. But uh, Ernest Hemingway, I took a class on Ernest Hemingway, so you had to read like six of his books and short stories and all this stuff. I liked Ernest Hemingway because he was kind of like Indiana Jones. I mean, he's really cool. So he had this uh, short story that I read in college called Capital of the World. And in Capital of the World, there was a father who, for whatever reason, and I can't remember, put his son out. I'm done with you, you've done X, Y, and Z. You disappointed me, you're lazy, drink too much. I don't I can't remember what his name was Paco. I can't remember what Paco did. But Paco got kicked out the door. And uh, years go by, the father is at a point now where he's reflecting back over his life and regrets putting his son out. So he goes to uh, Madrid, Spain, biggest town in, in, in Spain, and he puts an ad in the paper that says, Paco, your father loves you. I'm sorry. Now, this is before Facebook. Meet me at 9 o'clock in front of the courthouse in Madrid. Dad gets up the next morning and turns out, uh, in Spain, the name Paco is actually very popular. <laughs> and he gets there, and there are 600 young men there named Paco, who have all been estranged from their father. It's pretty sad. 
So anyway, it sounds funny, 600 Pacos, but it's actually pretty sad. And what I'm going to talk about today is there are people in our world and people in our community and probably people sitting here this morning who feel estranged. And we're going to talk a little bit about a, a guy from the Bible who felt estranged. He had a very interesting name. Um, his name was Mephibosheth. Say that quickly three times. Uh, Mephibosheth was uh, the grandson of Saul, King Saul. And he was the son of Jonathan. And the Bible tells us that Jonathan and David had a very, very close relationship. Um, they were best friends, and they even did stuff like, you know, back in the old days, you did a lot of pledges and covenants and all kinds of stuff like that. And at some point, they made a covenant to each other that basically, you know, uh, this friendship will last, that, that I'm going to make sure that my descendants... And your descendants continue this this friend this friendship. And um, after Saul's death, when David became king, um, one of Saul's other children, not Jonathan, because Jonathan also died with his father. Um, his name was, you know, I love these names. Ishabeth became the king. He said. David said he was the king. Ishabeth said, I'm the king. So guess what that caused? Civil war. They had a long civil war. And finally, uh, David wipes him out. And David's the king. That's where the story starts off. Um, our scripture today is in Samuel, 2 Samuel, verse 9. Uh, chapter 9, starting with verse 1. David asked, when it says David asked, now he's the king, I think he's in the throne room with all his people. David asked to his people, is there anyone still left in the house of Saul that I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They called Ziba in and he said, I'm your servant. And the king said again, is there anybody left? from Saul's family that I can show kindness to. And Ziba answered the king and said, There is still a son of Jonathan left who is crippled in both feet. Where is he? The king asked. Ziba answered, He is at the house of Makar, son of whatever, in Lodabar. Lodabar. We'll go with Lodabar. I don't the guy, his name's not for. So King David had him brought from Lodabar from the house to him. And when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to show his respect. David said, Mephibosheth, your servant, he replied, don't be afraid. David said to him, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Just like today, eating was a big deal back then. Okay? Sitting at the king's table was a big deal. But Phibosheth bowed down and said, What is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? So he says, I'm not worthy. You know, I'm, I'm nothing. Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's servant again, and said to him, I have given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him, bring in the crops, so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Then Ziba said to the king, Your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands his servant to do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth also had a young son. But that verse in, in, ends, because he always ate at the king's table, and he was crippled in both feet. So we have Mephibosheth, who 
went from being the grandson of the king. So you think about the life he had, right? He had probably nice clothes, chariots, nice um, palace. I was teaching the kids one time, and I said, I was telling the story, and I said he had a hot tub. And one of the kids raised their hand and said, they didn't have hot tubs back then. So I took out the hot tub part. Um, but anyway, he lived a life, he lived like a king. He was the grandson of the king. And now we have him in a place where he is lost to the world. I mean, he's basically at this point, you know, somebody that when you're, you know, walking down the street in the big city is their baby. And the Bible tells us he was crippled in both feet. Now, if you go back to some other verses, uh, what it tells us happened is when Mephibosheth was five years old and they were in this war with the Philistines. Y'all remember Goliath? He was one of the Philistines. Uh, the Philistines killed Saul, who was the king, killed Jonathan, who was the king's son and Mephibosheth's father. And the story goes, and it tells us in the Bible, that his nurse, basically the Philistines were knocking at the door. His nurse grabbed him and took off running and dropped him. And as a result, he was crippled. And, you know, back then, uh, they didn't have scooters, wheelchairs, anything like that. When you were crippled... Uh, th there's a story in Acts 2 uh, where Peter and Camel uh, uh, crippled and the story tells us that every day this guy's friends had to get up, take him, sit him outside the temple at the gate. He would beg all day and then somebody would come and pick him up in the afternoon and take him back home. So Mephibosheth was really at the mercy of everybody. You know, he was completely at the mercy. And, you know, he was crippled. The story says several times that he was crippled. And a lot of us and a lot of people that we encounter, you know, both in and out of this church are crippled too. And most of the time it's not the kind of cripple you can see. Some people are crippled physically. They may have a sickness. They may have a disease. They may have uh, breathing problems. You know, I could go on and on. And some people are crippled physically. You can see it. They can't walk. But some people are crippled morally, either by something they've done in the past which continues to cripple them or something they're doing now. Some people are crippled spiritually that, that we cannot resolve ourselves to the fact that God loves us. You know how sad that is? There's a lot of people who think God doesn't love them. You know, we talk about all the time, God loves you. You know, that, that's kind of a cliche we talk about all the time. But there is a lot of people, when you actually talk to them and get down to them, they will tell you, God doesn't love me. God can't love me. So you can be crippled in a lot of ways, just like Mephibosheth was. And I imagine, you know, Mephibosheth's favorite two words were probably, why me? Right? Because when something cripples us, that's the first thing we say. Why is this happening to me? I'm a good person. I pay my bills. I, I go to church. Um, I come to family night supper and eat Stanley's chicken every week. Why me? And you know, that's probably what Mephibosheth said every day. Why me? I went from everything to absolutely nothing. And he has to rely every day thinking, who is going to take care of me? Who is going to be the one that picks me up and helps me get out of bed every morning? You think about it. You can't even get out of bed. 
He can't get food. Who is going to take care of me? And then what he probably experiences, what we experience sometimes when we're crippled by something, he probably saw all the other young people around him jumping around, playing. I don't know what they played back then. Saw other young men find a wife, find a job. And he sat there probably every day and said, how come they get it and I don't? Because when we're crippled, that's what we do, right? We want to look out instead of in. We want to say, how come they get X, Y, and Z and I get this? How come their kids are perfect and I'm struggling with all this stuff? How come their spouse gave them all that stuff for Valentine's and I got Jack? <laughs> because we've all been disappointed, just like my fifth chef. We've all had tragedies. You've lost a job. You've lost a friend. You've been betrayed by somebody. You've been sick. And then some of us are dealing with stuff like fear. They live every day with fear, with doubt, with worry. And you can't see that stuff. You can't see that stuff. So, lucky for Mephibosheth, he had all that stuff that was negative. But the one thing he had at the end of the day was that somebody was looking for him. See, David didn't even know who he was. If you notice, that's an important part of the story. He didn't call in there and said, hey, go get Mephibosheth for me. He didn't even know his name. He said, go find, if you see, find anybody else from this uh, Jonathan's family, go get them for me. Because here's the most important part of the story today. Mephibosheth did not go looking for the king. The king came looking for him. Because, see, as a general rule, as a general rule, most people think that if I'm crippled by something I've done, something other people think I've done, pain, all that, they don't think God's coming for them. But over and over, what our Bible tells us is that we have a God who, when we're crippled by the fall, comes and looks for us. There's all kinds of stories Jesus told. I could recite several of them. Uh, there's a nice one where he's got a hundred sheep. And what's he do? He leaves all these other sheep and says, for yourself, I'm going to go find this one crippled sheep over here that got left behind. Right? It tells us that Lodabar is where they found Jonathan, even though I think I, I mean Mr. Pibbishep, even though where I said that wrong. Lodabar means a place of no bread. A desolate place. When we're in a desolate place. That's when Jesus comes looking for us. Right? Jesus, you know, when, when we got it rocking and going on, and we're not crippled, that's not when we need somebody to come find us. Right? When we're cruising through life, smooth sailing, we're not worried about if somebody's coming to look for us. What we're worried about is when we're in Lodabar, the desolate place, the place with no bread. I'm going back to my eating. Not only am I crippled, I'm starving. One of my favorite verses in the Bible is 
Luke 15, 20. It's in the story of the prodigal son. And to paraphrase, it says, the son's coming back and the father was looking for him. And when he saw him, what did he do? He ran. He ran. The son didn't run to the father. The father ran to the son. So, we can't be crippled enough for God not to look for us. We can't be in such a desolate place for God not to look for us. We can't earn it. Because you know why he looked for Mephibosheth? Because of who his father was. Because of who his father was. And you're a child of God. We do a song called No Longer Slaves, and there's a line that says, I am a child of God. You're a child of God. And your father's always going to come looking for you. Come on, man. Now, here's the important thing. I want y'all to remember when we leave here. Me too. Most of y'all sitting here already know that. You're sitting here. You know, you've heard this stuff. You know, come up here, you talk, you teach Sunday school, and everybody's like, oh, I know that story. 99, what did you get the one little sheep? And the guy took off running. Most of the people who were in Lodabar don't know that story. And you know how they're going to find out? Somebody like you is going to tell them. Somebody like you, who has the favor of the king, needs to go looking for them. Like David sent people looking for Mephibosheth. Father, thank you for this opportunity today to worship you. Thank you for being a father that always looks for us when we're lost and help us to understand that in your world and in your love and in your palace, that there's nothing that we can do, that there's nothing that can cripple us that will keep our Father from looking for us. We ask all these things in your name. Amen. Please stand while we'll I close out the service. Yeah.